I told him that I couldn't mentally handle an abortion, he looked up different ways to get abortions and which ones were less mentally taxing and which ones he thought I would be able to handle. Welcome to the Blind Mom Life Podcast. I'm your host, Chelsea Painter Davis, blind wife, mother, and public speaker. I want to invite you to dive deep with my special guests and I as we talk conquering disabilities, cherishing motherhood, and choosing life. Are you ready? Action. All right, today we're going to talk Ella Enchanted. This is a cute, charming, whimsical Cinderella retelling that I just love. Not only is it funny and dorky and charming, it answers that ever bothersome question of why did Cinderella always do everything she was told. This bothered me so much as a kid, and I loved reading Ella Enchanted so much when I was in middle school because I felt like I finally got a good answer. So in this story, there is a fairy named Lucinda who always loves to give beautiful babies the most beautiful gifts, but there's one catch. Lucinda's gifts suck. So when Ella was born, Lucinda used her magic to make Ella ever obedient. She would do everything she was told ever by everyone. And what Lucinda thought was the most precious, obedient child was actually a child who was in grave danger. Because when everyone controls your life but you, you can become very unsafe very quickly. She would have friends telling her to lose the race when she wanted to win. She would have people telling her to eat cake until she couldn't stop and she would have to oblige no matter how sick she got. But as she got older, the commands escalated. Soon her evil stepsisters would force her to steal things she did not want to steal or tell friends to go away and never speak to her again when she really did love them. All of these problems just barraged Ella's life and she couldn't stop them because the curse made her physically compelled her to be obedient no matter how much she was hurting herself. At one point, she's even forced to surrender to ogres who want to eat her just because they told her to and she couldn't physically say no. It's not until the curse starts to affect others that she has the courage and the strength to put all into the fight and finally utter the words, you will no longer be obedient. This might not seem relatable to our own lives with its magic curses, compelling action, but when you're a people pleaser and you really ache in your bones at the thought of telling someone else no, and you really feel like it's on you to keep them happy, and you really think that your boundaries are an offense to them, your boundaries are wrong, and they're not healthy, and you're asking too much, and it would be so much easier, and everyone would be so much happier if you just did what others asked you to do. I can feel like a curse. I felt far too many times the need to tell someone no, but it's like the word gets stuck in my throat and it won't come out. This can happen to people when they just feel scared. They don't know what's going to happen if they say no, because they've seen far too many times a bad reaction when they were forced to say no. This happened with my friend Ivy, and I'm so excited to share with you that she had a moment just like Ella where what she was asked to do was too much, and she found the courage, just like Ella, to say no. All right, Ivy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, My name is Ivy. I grew up in Maryland. I came down here when I was seven. Um, been here ever since. I'm married to Logan and we've got two boys. 
and I'm a stay-at-home mom to one of those boys right now. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience with your first son? Uh, what are your What are your kids' names? Uh, Benji is my first. Um, he's five. He'll be six in May. And Jasper is my second. And he's two. He'll be three in April. So when did you find out you were pregnant with Benji? And why don't you tell us some of that story? Um, so I found out I was pregnant with Benji when I was 20 years old, um, which was, I'm 27 now. <laughs> um, and I found out right after we had a hurricane. Uh, it was Hurricane Irma, I believe. Um, and I did not expect to be pregnant. I kind of just picked up a test because my period was a couple of days late and um, I did not expect it to be positive, but it very much was. <laughs> um, and what emotions were you feeling at the time? Like, were you trying to get pregnant with Benji? Were you I was not, not. trying? <laughs> um, it wasn't really in the front of my mind. Like, I, I wasn't expecting to have kids that young. Um, but I had always wanted to be a mother. So, mm -hmm. um, I was scared and nervous, but part of me was happy too. So who's the first person that you told you were pregnant? Cause you hadn't even, you hadn't even met your husband, Logan at that time. Right. Right. Correct. Um, the first person I told was one of my friends that I worked with. Um, he was over at my apartment at the time and I came out. And I showed him the pregnancy test and we kind of freaked out together. Um, and then the next morning I called my mom and told her, uh, and she was very supportive. She asked me what I wanted to do. How was I going to tell the dad? Um, and then I ended up telling the dad that later that morning. So when you say that you and your friend freaked out, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, what were you freaking out about? Um, I mean, <laughs> besides just the fact that like, oh my goodness, I'm pregnant. I didn't mean to be pregnant. What's, what specifically in that was like freaking you out? Um, I guess it was just kind of unbelievable. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't think that I was going to be, I didn't think I was ever going to get pregnant that young. Um, like, in my mind, I was going to be married before I had kids. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just not the case. So, so when you tell the father of your baby, what, how did that conversation go? Were you nervous? Were you excited to tell him? I was so nervous to tell him. Um, he lived about five minutes away from me. So I just asked if I could come over that morning and we had been working from home, um, because the place that we worked where his dad and I worked together, um, the parking garage had been flooded so everybody was working from home and I went over there and I remember shaking just on my way up to his apartment I was so nervous um and I told him that I had to talk to him about something and he sat down and I said I'm pregnant and he said you're joking I said I'm not and he said then you have to get an abortion that's the first thing he said to you yes Yes. What did that feel like? Because like you didn't, you didn't intend to have this pregnancy, but like you had already said, like you were kind of excited, like hopeful to be a mother eventually. What did it feel like for that to be the first thing he says to you? It felt like all of the air just kind of went out of my lungs. Like I was a little bit baffled that he said that, that that was his first thought. Um, and I told him, I didn't think I could do that. And so he said, well, then we need to make a pros and cons list. And he told me to go home, make my pros and cons list. And then we would, uh, get together either later that day or the next day and go over our list and see if it was worth it to continue the pregnancy. I'm just... <laughs> Are you ki you're kidding me. You're kidding me right now. Like you say, Hey, I'm pregnant. You're the dad. And then he's like, you get an abortion. And then you're like, no, I don't really feel comfortable with that. And then his response is this manipulation of like, Oh, I'll, we'll make a list and then I'll convince you. 
That's what he was going with there? Yes. You see? Oh. Ah! Oh my gosh! When I told him that I couldn't mentally handle an abortion, he looked up different ways to get abortions and which ones were less mentally taxing and which ones he thought I would be able to handle. Okay. Let's dive deep into that. I am so curious how he thought that you may it very clear. Like I, I can't handle an abortion. This is not what I want to do. I'm, what did he think would make that better? Like, what did he think would make it feel not like an abortion to you? Since you're say, you saying no was not enough for him. I have no idea. He looked up like the pills that you could take and these centers that you could go to where they treat you nicely um, and like support you through it. And I just kept telling him like, I can't, I can't do that. And I didn't really take the pros and cons list seriously either. Like I, I barely wrote anything on it. Like I think for the pros I put, we have a cute baby and the cons, <laughs> the cons I put uh, were young. And that I only wrote like three things down and mm -hmm. his, his pros list was like, there was one thing on it and it was an, it was a sheet of notebook paper and on the pros list side, there was one thing. And on the cons list, it took up the entire front side of the paper and the oh, entire wow. back side and all of like the sides of the paper. He wrote so many cons and he went through every single one of them. He made me sit down and listen to every single con that he had. Say. Wait, so if you're the one pregnant with the baby, why was he making a pros and cons list? He did not want the pregnancy. He did not want the baby. He did not want me to continue with the pregnancy. He thought we were too young. He didn't want people to talk at the office about us. Um, he didn't want people finding out that I was pregnant. Um, and he... I mean, eventually, um, eventually we, we got to the point where, um, like later in the pregnancy, uh, he wouldn't let me post anything online about it. I was eight months pregnant when he finally said that I could post something about it. I was 32 weeks when I made my first so, like, social media post. So not only did he want you to have an abortion and was trying to pressure you into an abortion with this pros and cons list, he, when you refused and you're now eight months pregnant at this point, I mean, still legal to get abortion in some places. So that was still, unfortunately, an option. He won't even, he doesn't even want people to know? No, he did not want anybody to know. How do you hide an eight month well, pregnant belly? I had, I had lost my job at the place that we worked. Um, what like, happened? They, they let me go. Um, I told them, I told my boss that I was pregnant, and then two days later, I was let go. What? Um, I don't know if it was because of my pregnancy, or if I, I feel like it was, but it was also, it could have been my performance, because um, a lot was happening at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I no longer worked at that office, so I, there wasn't really an issue of him hiding the pregnancy there, because I was no longer working there, and it was just him. Did he, so he worked at that office too? Yes. And we were just in different departments. Okay. D did people know that you guys were together or did he not want them to even know that about you? He didn't really want anyone to know that we were together. He wanted to hide everything about the relationship and the pregnancy. Wow. So let's go back to that moment where he's making this pros and cons. Not only has he asked you to make a pros and con li cons list, he's felt it's appropriate for him to make a pros and cons list, even though you're the one pregnant with the baby. It's supposed to be your decision. What, how, do you, how did you even respond in this moment that you said he's forcing you to sit down and listen to his like two pages of cons about your pregnancy that he's made it clear he doesn't want to have anything to do with? I don't remember how I responded. I think, I think I just told him that I couldn't have an abortion and I would go through with the pregnancy without him if I needed to. Like I told him he did not have to be a part of it. He did not have to stay with me. Um, we didn't have to be together. I would do it on my own. And he said that because his dad had left him um, when he was a young age and not been there for him, he wasn't going to do that to his kid. 
Um, but that didn't really change the way that he acted. He did, just because he stayed. He stayed with me, but he was not supportive. So what did that look like on like a day-to-day basis? Um, like he's there physically. Did you guys move in together after you told him you were pregnant? Or? Yes, um, we did uh, because my lease was up at my apartment um, the next month. So he just had me move in with him. Um, and I had lost my job at that point. So, um, I had to go get a different job, which ended up being Bed Bath and Beyond. And I was working there. Um, he, he was like, we had good days. Um, but some days like he would portion my food for me. If I wanted snacks, he wouldn't let me eat too many snacks. Um, because he didn't want to buy food for you because you just lost your job for possibly being pregnant and he was still working there he said he didn't want me to gain too much weight during my pregnancy i'm sorry what yes i need to hear that again that uh, how does that come out of like a human (laughs) face hole like i'm sorry what oh my gosh ivy so oh wow (laughs) i'm so offended right now and that wasn't even you're not even me, and I'm offended. <laughs> he he did not, yeah. He didn't want me to gain too much weight with my pregnancy. Um, he would get angry if I drank all the water bottles. Because um, I was, I had to, you're supposed to drink a gallon of water a day when you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. And I drank water all the time, because I was. Yeah, that's like, what, like eight or more water bottles, yeah. I think. And eventually he ended up getting a Brita so that I wouldn't drink all the water bottles. Um, <laughs> For the record of people watching this podcast that uh, me and Ivy both live in central Florida and the tap water tastes disgusting. Yes, it does. <laughs> so Brita filter water bottles are required to yes. drink water around here because it tastes absolutely horrid. Yes, it does. Um, but yeah, he never, he didn't go to a single OB appointment with me. Um, he went to one ultrasound appointment. Um but he was only there for a minute and then went back to work immediately. Um, he he just wasn't very supportive. There was, I remember there was one time I, I got a job as a receptionist for this um, guy in St. Pete. And um, while I was working, I started seeing like black spots in my vision. And I was about 33 weeks at Oh, that that's time. really scary. And so... I was like, okay, well, it could be preeclampsia or Mm -hmm. something. Like, I'm also anemic. So it was just like, there was a lot of things that it could have been. Mm -hmm. And I called my OB after work and he said to go just get checked out at the hospital. And so I told told my boyfriend um, that I was going to the hospital to get checked out. And he was like, why? And I was like, because I'm seeing black spots. It could be this, this, or this. And he was like, I don't think that's necessary. I think you're doing too much. And I went and got checked out, and it ended up being nothing. Um, I was just a little dehydrated. Um, Mm -hmm. But That actually happened. um, That happened to me uh, at 35-ish weeks when I was pregnant with my daughter. Mm -hmm. I I know a lot of people find this weird, but I still have a little bit of vision left. So I was having uh, a dimness in my vision and I freaked out too. And when I called the doctor, they were like, yeah, this could be really serious. You have to come to the ER. And I ended up just being, I had been really overexerted and mm. exhausted and I needed to eat and drink and go to bed, yeah. um, which a nesting mother doesn't want to do. Yeah. You want to get the baby's bedroom ready. So yeah, that, that same thing happened to me. And you're right. It could be preeclampsia, which, um, doesn't just cause issues with the baby it can kill you yes if untreated you could die like and he didn't want you to go to the er yeah. you could have died i i got home at around eleven thirty that night and he was so angry with me he didn't talk to me that night he didn't talk to me the next morning he was angry that i had gone to the er and was he checked out worried he'd have to help you with the the bill for the er what I, what was the concern there i don't know he was he was just upset that I had gone and like wasted time or something. I'm I'm I shouldn't say that because I'm not 100 percent sure. But he I just remember him being so angry and not talking to me for a while. So it sounds like there's just 
there's a lot going on in him that you didn't really understand where all this anger was coming from. He had very bad anger issues, and I did not know that until after we had been together for a while. But his his anger issues are what ended up splitting us up mm-hmm. because they were they were just too much. So you're walking through this pregnant this unintended surprise pregnancy, and you said you called your mom. You had the support of your mom, mm-hmm. but the baby, your child's father, the post, the person who you probably need the support from the most out of everybody is completely against this pregnancy, is uh, talking to you, uh, trying to get you not to eat food, trying to get you to stop drinking all the water, trying to keep you out of a proper health care checks. And how do you how do you just push forward with that? Like, I know so many women, when they find themselves pregnant, the first person they look to is the father to judge, like, are you going to support me or are you not? And that can have such an impact on whether the woman chooses to continue the pregnancy or not. Where's the, where's the strength in that, that you not only looked at your baby's father and said, no, I, I'm not getting an abortion. I don't care how long your cons list is, but you continued with the pregnancy, trying to make sure that you were getting proper care and kept pushing through when you might as, it seems like you almost might as well have been alone. I, it definitely felt like I was alone, um, but I had the support of my mom. She was in Pennsylvania and she would tell me almost weekly, like you can, you can move up here to Pennsylvania and, and we'll, we'll help like her. My stepdad would help me and, and care for me and support me while I'm up there. Um, but it was bigger than me. Like I, I felt responsible Mm -hmm. for the baby growing inside of me and I did not want to let that baby down I wanted and I kept I feel like I just kept holding out hope that um that the father would change and that it would be it would be good like it had been before I got pregnant um Mm -hmm. but it just never got back to that but um his his grandma was very supportive and his grandma really helped me through a lot of those times, a lot of those hard times, she was there for me. That's awesome. What kind of stuff did she do that made you feel supported? Um, we would go over to her house and eat dinner. She was just very easy to talk to. Um, and she went, what I went through with him, she went through with his grandpa. Oh, really? Yes. So we were able to just kind of talk about that and bond over that. And she gave me a lot of advice. Um, after I had Benji, there were times where I would go spend the night at her house for a couple of days uh, mm-hmm. with Benji. And um, she was always so welcoming and so loving and supportive. And she's the one who got me uh, back in my relationship with God or wanting to have that relationship again. Really? Yes. Um, she, she is a very faithful woman. And we still have a wonderful relationship. I, I just saw her yesterday, actually. Um, she's a wonderful woman, and I try to go and visit her anytime I can because she's she was a huge support for me during those mm-hmm. times. So she didn't make you feel like you the, you were the problem? Not at all. I know sometimes, um, just from our... Um, third podcast episode that we released unfortunately like the woman on there was sharing that like christian people were not who supported her Mm -hmm. during her pregnancy and so that makes me happy to hear that you did find that one person who was gonna say to you like hey it's gonna be okay (laughs) she did and she even after benji was born she invited me to church with her and i was like i'm not sure because i i had told her i didn't want to feel judged yeah um at church being an unmarried woman with a child and she was like there's none of that here and I went to church with her and I held Benji through the service and we walked around and everyone was very nice and very welcoming to me they were not judgmental of me at all oh that makes me so happy that was your experience because it's so painful when the church gives the opposite reaction so that makes me happy for you that that happened and that Oh, that sweet church, that sweet, and not even your own grandmother. Your um, so your baby's great grandmother. That's yes. so that's so sweet. All right, so why don't you tell us about how the birth went? Um, so the birth was kind of hard. Um, 
I ended up, I was induced on a Monday. Um, my, my mom picked me up from the apartment. She uh, got me McDonald's for breakfast. We had, she got me pancakes and a Coke because uh, we knew once I was admitted, I wasn't going to be able to eat really um, until I had Benji. Um, and we, we got there probably around eight in the morning. I was set up by nine um, and his father ended up coming around seven o'clock that night, maybe 730. Um, so he didn't show up when you checked into the hospital. No, he was working that day. Um, he didn't plan to take off for you no. to be having a baby. No, he did not. He wanted to work up until the last possible second. Um, so he knew, and, and with inductions, he knew that he had some time before I was going to have the baby. Like, mm -hmm. um, And at that point, I was in a lot of pain from the contractions. I couldn't really speak. Um, I got the epidural later that night. Uh, and I slept finally with the epidural. I slept until eight in the morning when my doctor broke my water. Um, and at nine o'clock, I woke up and felt like I could push. So uh, my boyfriend's mom went and got the nurse and she came in and said, I can see his head. So don't move, don't breathe, don't sneeze. I'm gonna go get your doctor. And Benji came out 27 minutes later. So it was a very quick birth. Um, but I, I ended up hemorrhaging, um, and I lost a lot of blood and that's really scary. It was scary. Um, cause I didn't know that it was happening. Actually, mm -hmm. I, I was told about it later, but I just remember feeling just so dizzy and so faint. Um, I felt very weak and, um, on my third day in the hospital, I ended up needing a blood transfusion. Um, which made our hospital stay five days. And my boyfriend was not happy about that. Um, he didn't want to be in the hospital for that long. He wanted to be there for a day or two. And it ended up, it ended up being five days. And he just he was upset by that. Was he planning on going straight back to work once yes. you left the hospital? Yes. Um, he did not. He ended up taking off that the rest of that week. So from Tuesday to Friday, he took off. Mm -hmm. um, and he was not happy about it. He wanted to get back to work as fast as possible. So what was it like being able to hold your baby boy for the first time? Um, it was, it was wonderful. Um, scary, but life changing. Um, there's, you know, you're responsible for the baby when they're in, when they're in you, when they're in the womb, but once they're out, it's a whole different responsibility. Um, that, carries on for the rest of your life and that it's very much life-changing but I was very happy to have him I was very happy to have him out of me and be done with the birth mm -hmm. um I feel like giving birth is the scariest part of being pregnant um at least for me I think for most women yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it was it was good to have him um and I was excited to have him and he was just the cutest little thing. I took so many pictures of him that night. Um, so it was, it was, it was good to have him out and with me. So how did you, um, you, this whole pregnancy, you're not being supported. You're being told to abort. You're being pressured to hide your pregnancy. Even at eight months pregnant, you're not supposed to let anyone know that you're pregnant. Did any of that behavior change once you brought your baby home or was it still that same just I really wish Ivy that you wouldn't have done this to me attitude that your boyfriend's having it was the same attitude but it was worse um how could it be worse he I felt like a single parent um with a roommate who slept next to me um he did not change diapers he did not feed Benji. He did not ever take care of Benji so that I could go out with friends. It was always him who was able to go out and do whatever he wanted. I was not allowed to do that. Um, he, he had me 
go back to work when I was five weeks postpartum. Um, he didn't want me st staying home with Benji um, because he did not want to be the sole person to pay the bills, which I understand. Um, but that was very hard for me as a new mom to leave my child with a nanny at five weeks postpartum. Um, it, it he he was just an angry person. Um, so he would play video games every night until about two or three o'clock in the morning, and Benji would wake up during those hours, and he would never he would never put down the video game to go be with Benji. Um, he would always come and wake me up so that I would take care of him. Uh -huh. um, he he didn't do anything for n nine months until I finally left him. He did not do a single thing for Benji. What was that like leaving? Because I know it's, like, it's hard enough to have a kid in a fully stable marriage household with a good income. Like that's still really hard. Mm -hmm. So what's that like um, having trouble with your job? Like you were fired after becoming pregnant. Um, you've gotten a new job, but it's still difficult. You're your boyfriend's not supporting you. You have this fresh new baby. What's that like trying to move on with your life and make a new circumstance for yourself when so many people would point to that situation and say that's when women can't do it? It was very hard. Um, it was incredibly hard to leave him because I, I thought about all... It was like any typical abusive relationship. I was looking at it with rose-colored glasses. I was seeing all the good times that we had and because we did have good days we had good moments we had um you know we had good times together but the bad really outweighed the good and every time i wanted to leave i was having trouble remembering that um but i had the support of my mom and i i broke up with him before we were going to work one day i remember I walked out of the, we had fought about something. I walked out of the apartment. I walked back in and I said, we need to break up. And he was like, he was like, that's fine. I was going to do it last night, but you were asleep when I came home. So, wow. um, so I was just like, okay. And I left and I went to work and I told my mom I needed her help getting all of my things and all of Benji's things out of the apartment. And they were there, um, she was living in uh, West Virginia at that time. Um, so her, she came and we took all of our stuff out. We brought them to uh, Lakeland from Clearwater. And then Benji and I went on a road trip up to West Virginia with my mom and we stayed up there for about a month. And, um, and it was hard. Um, I still talked to his dad during that time um, again because I was I was like well maybe it'll get better it was like still looking at it with those rose-colored glasses I was like maybe it'll get better maybe we just need some time apart um, and when we came back to Lakeland I we got back together actually and so I would drive over to Clearwater to see him a couple times a week mm -hmm. um, and I eventually got a job at Olive Garden. I was a server. And um, and that's my trainer uh, was, is now my husband. <laughs> um, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, he was my he was my trainer at Olive Garden. Um, and I ended up breaking up with his dad again about three weeks after I started that job. Mm -hmm. um, because was it just the same? It was, it was that, but he, because we had been broken up, he didn't trust me. And so if I... He didn't trust you. No. Um, so if I would, if I told him I was getting off at a certain time, which when you're a server, you never get off at the time that it says, like you're always there yeah. later. Um, I would tell him I'm supposed to get off at this time, but it'll probably be later. He would think that I was cheating on him. And so he would freak out if I didn't call him or text him within like five, 10 minutes of me getting off or when I was supposed to get off. And he would always accuse me of cheating on him. So I was like, I can't, I can't do this every day. I can't do this anymore. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm broke up with him again and 
And that time it was final. Because I was like, I can't live the rest of my life like this. It's not doable. So what is your life like now for you and Benji? You mentioned that you found you met your husband, mm-hmm. who would become your eventual husband. What is, um, how's your life changed since those moments? My life has changed dramatically um, in the best way possible. Um, Logan is the best man that I could have ever asked for. Um, I'm not going to cry <laughs> because I told you it's I didn't okay. like tissues. <laughs> <laughs> it's always okay to cry. <laughs> I know. Um, Logan is the best man I could have asked for. Um, he is so wonderful. Um, he cares for Benji as if Benji is his own. He has never told Benji differently. Um, he treats Benji and Jasper the same. Um, he he loves us, and he he's just an amazing man. He, when I was pregnant with Jasper, um, he was so excited. Like immediately, he was excited, and obviously we were nervous because it's just adding another kid. But wow. he was so excited. He supported me in every single way that I could have asked for, and more. Um, he would. He would give me the world if he could. He's an incredible person. He is selfless. Um, he is never quick to anger. He's so kind. He's got the biggest heart. And I could not have asked for a better husband and a be- better father to my children. And he is a godly man. And that is, that is something that I wanted in a husband. And Benji's father was not a godly man. No matter how much I tried to get him to go to church, he would not. And Logan is the one who brought me back to church when I when I moved back over to Lakeland. Um, he he brought me back to church, and he he got me in with his family, and um, and we eventually found the church that we go to now, Lakes. And um, he's just an amazing man. So what would you say to another woman who finds herself, or even a girl, finds herself in a situation like yours, like holding this positive pregnancy test, like I didn't I didn't mean to get pregnant, this is what wasn't what I thought I was going to have, and maybe they're just as scared as you were, or they have a partner who's just as angry about it as yours was. What would you say to uh, inspire them and encourage them? Listen to your heart. Do not let people pressure you to do things that you feel in your bones that you do not want to do. Um, When somebody, if your family or your friends are there to support you, take their support and lean on them because the people who are in those hard times with you are what's going to get you through those hard times. and just don't let don't let people walk all over you. Um, don't let people be mean to you and, and pressure you to do things. Um, I it's it's very hard when you're in an abusive relationship to leave, and it takes most women. I think the statistic is like between four and seven times to finally leave their abuser. Um, And I made it out after two, and that's usually not the case. Um, But if you feel like something is wrong, if you feel like you are not being treated the way that you want to or deserve to be treated, then leave, (laughs) like, because it will get better. And you can find someone who will be the person that you deserve. And there are better people out there for you. It's never too late to say no to abuse. It's never too early to say no to toxic. The only person who can make your boundaries is you. And it is not your responsibility to worry and fret 
over the reactions that other people will have when they stamp their foot and get angry because your whole life isn't about serving their whims. You are strong enough, you are brave enough, and there are people who will want to help you if you ask so you can find a way to a new life that is created by you. Time for Ask Me Anything. So the first question I have for you today is, are your other senses heightened after losing your vision? And the answer to that is, no, I am not Daredevil, I'm not Toph from Avatar The Last Airbender, and I do not have magical powers. I have the same senses that you do, I'm just more aware of them. You spend so much of your time when you have vision focused on the information that you're getting visually. And it makes sense because your vision reaches out to gather, gather information much farther away from you than your other senses do. Think about your sense of touch. Can you feel things in the other room? No, no, you can pretty much only feel what's touching you, right? What's literally on your skin, that's what you can feel. And what about sense of taste? Can you taste the food that the person next to you is eating? Of course not, it's not in your mouth. And what about hearing? You can hear pretty far away, especially if it's a really loud sound. So that one's super helpful. But what about sight? You can see so far away and you can see above a whole city if you're high enough or once you add in pictures. Oh my goodness, you can see things that are in outer space. That's crazy. The visual information that you are being given to your brain. So of course, why wouldn't you focus on visual, especially above taste or smell or sense of touch? It just communicates so much more information at such a farther distance. I think even more information than sound does. So of course you're going to rely on that. But what you're training off when you fill your focus with vision is you're muffling your other senses in a way that you probably don't even realize. So I'll illustrate with an example. When I go to the grocery store with my husband, I do not need him to tell me that we are in the freezer section. I can hear it and I can feel it. So the ways that I can feel it are the freezers are cold. When I walk past them, my skin gets cold and there's not much that does that in a grocery store besides the freezer section. And then I can hear it and then I can hear the humming of the freezers, but also I can hear how the sound, the echo back from my stepping, the grocery cart changes when we turn onto that aisle. So la open spaces, the sound kind of goes farther off from me before bouncing back to my ears. When I'm in a small contained space like an aisle, it is louder because it bounces off the fridges and back to my ears faster. In a way, I guess that's kind of like echolocation, but you have that too. If you were blindfolded, you'd be able to hear that you'd be able to feel all of that. You're just not paying attention. So it's not that my senses are any better after losing my vision. It's just that I've learned to pay attention to the information that they've always been giving me. The next question I have for you today is, do you dream after losing your vision? And yes, I do dream. The dreams seem pretty similar for the most part to when I was a kid and I did have full vision, but I have noticed the longer I've been blind, they visual components have started to get a little blurry. And even sometimes in my dream, I find myself reminding my dream conscious that, hey, you're not supposed to be able to see that. You're blind. You can't do whatever task I was trying to do, like drive a car. I have that in dreams a lot. I'll be like, Chelsea, you can't drive a car. You're blind. And so in my dream, I will start to only be able to see a few feet in front of the car instead of the full landscape ahead on the horizon. And it is kind of interesting to see how my dreams are trying to update for the fact that my subconscious like, or my conscious knows that I'm blind. It's kind of a curious thing, but definitely still dream, definitely still see in my dreams. That part has not changed. 
If you want to see more content from me, you can follow me on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, X, or you can check out my website, ChelseaPainterDavis.com. That is a great place to sign up for my newsletter or recommend a friend for the podcast. Do you know someone with an inspiring story? I would love to hear about it. Also, if you like what I do and you want to see me at one of your events, you can click on the Book Now tab of the website and submit a speaking request. I would love to connect with you. Thank you so much for hanging around through the end of the episode. I hope today that we have shown you that all life is worth living. Just like in the book of Esther, where God paints a beautiful portrait from the background, God is painting a beautiful portrait with your life, and we can learn so much from each other if we only share our stories. Whenever it feels like the darkness is pressing in, just remember the words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 9. As long as I am in the world, I am the light. There's something in my throat. <gasps>